Our speaker this week is Yasha Sor Dickstein. Yasha is a senior staff research scientist at Google Brain, where he leads a team spanning machine learning, physics, and uh, neuroscience. His career path is a long and interesting one. He started off by working on the science instrumentation of NASA's twin Mars rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. Then it earned him a PhD in biophysics. And finally, his path led him to work at Khan Academy, an online education site. The topic of his talk today, however, comes from pure machine learning. He's going to tell us about what happens as one increases the number of parameters in a neural network without bounds, and he will mention some surprising consequences along the way. So let me turn you over to Yasha. Please start once you're ready. Oh. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the generous introduction. Um, and thank you also for, for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I don't know if you can see the, the blackness out the window behind me, but it is, it's a lot earlier for me than it is, is probably for, for many of you. So, so um, apologies if, I, if I'm, um, my brain is still starting a little bit. Um, so first, to motivate this talk, it turns out that as neural networks become wider and more over-parameterized, they both perform better and they become more analytically tractable. Um, and in fact, in a limit of infinite width, you can often abstract away the parameters of the neural network entirely and make surprisingly strong closed form statements about the behavior of the network. And while this talk won't um, strictly be about connection between physics and machine learning, um, the analysis techniques and the way in which you are able to understand neural networks in this limit um, are basically ripped directly from statistical physics. So um, as, you, as you may or may not recognize, there will, there will end up being some, some, fairly, some fairly fundamental connections. Um, there are a couple places in the middle of the talk where it gets, where it gets dense, um, and it's particularly difficult to judge audience engagement or, or understanding her um, remotely. So, so if you have questions during the talk, uh, please feel encouraged to, to just ask it as I go along. You don't need to save it uh, for, for the end. I think it'll be, it'll be more helpful for, for everyone involved if there's, if there's some kind of feedback. Um, cool. So I'm going to talk about a large amount of work done by a large number of people. And, and just to make sure that I, I properly give the credit, um, I'd like to, to start out by just calling out the subset of them listed here, um, each of whom was a primary contributor for more than one of the results that, that I'll be uh, presenting. So, so just going from left to right to top to bottom, we have uh, Yasmin, Norman, Jaehoon, Surya, Jeffrey, um, Sam, myself, uh, Lei Chao, Craig, and, and Jerry. Or George. The overall structure of the talk is going to be like so. I'm going to try to motivate why overparameterized neural networks are an interesting object to study. I'm going to talk about the distribution over functions um, computed by randomly initialized neural networks. I'm going to show how you can use an understanding of this distribution over functions to predict when networks will be trainable. And then I'm going to show that, that perhaps surprisingly, these results don't just hold at neural network initialization, but also describe the distribution over functions that result from either Bayesian parameter estimation or SG training the network. So to dive in, why are over-parameterized networks and interesting object to study. Basically, they are because they do better. There is a, a history in machine learning of building larger and larger models and, and getting higher and higher accuracy. Even within a given model class though, test accuracy typically increases with increasing model width. Here we show experiments supporting that improvement with width for both fully connected and convolutional architectures applied to CPAR 10. So every point on the fully connected plots on 
the left corresponds to the same architecture and the same depth, but different settings of training and initial vision hyperparameters and different widths. In, in both of the plots, um, only models which achieve 100% training accuracy were found. So here, the generalization gap corresponds directly to, to test accuracy. You can see that if we take the best hyperparameters at each width, then wider models strictly outperform narrow models on test accuracy out to a width of 20,000, which is as wide as we can go, given, given the computer memory constraints we had in running the experiment. Um, similarly, in the, in the right plot, each line corresponds to the same convolutional architecture um, in terms of number of layers and nonlinearity used. Um, and for each point in the plot, we're performing an optimization over training initial fiction hyperparameters on a, on a validation set. And so you can see that in the plot on the right, once again, for complements with pooling, accuracy strictly increases with increasing width. Um, once again, this Sorry, goes uh, all the way. Can I just yeah. ask, width is the number of layers or the number of nodes in a layer? Awesome. Yeah, so width is the number of nodes in a layer. Okay. Um, or for a um, convolutional neural network, width is the number of channels in a layer. Right. Okay. And um, so this observation for both fully connected and CNNs and other architectures that we do better with, with strictly better with increasing width maybe raises the question, which is what happens in the limit of, of infinite width? So to start to answer that question, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna let's examine the properties of wide neural networks at initialization. Um, as as we're going to talk about in the second half part of the talk, though, many parts of this also apply to networks um, trained by gradient descent or or Bayesian parameter estimation. Um, this this next section is is going to reach um, peak mathematical complexity. And, and so, so this will be a particularly good time to ask questions if you, if you have them. Um, I'll, I'll call out when we reach the high water mark. So first, let's set up the system. So for simplicity, uh, we're gonna consider just a, a fully connected feed forward architecture. Uh, this architecture has inputs um, Y0, uh, pre-activations ZL and activations YL at layer L. Uh, the pre-activations are an affine transformation of the preceding activations with weights WL and biases VL. And both the weights and biases are initialized by draws from the Gaussian. You can see that in the little set of equations on the right-hand side um, with variance sigma squared W over width for the weights and variance sigma squared V for the bias. The output of the neural network for the neural network's logits are Z capital L. And uh, just for simplicity, we're gonna assume that the output of the neural network is one dimensional. So it just outputs a single scalar. Um, and I'm gonna leave this, this little cheat sheet about the network architecture in the upper right for, for a while. So before we dive in mathematically, I'm, let me illustrate visually what the core result is gonna be using a simple cartoon. So this plot compares the network's output, the, the logic Z capital L for two different inputs, X and X star. Um, so if we draw a sample of the parameters data from their prior, and then we compute the output of the neural network for those parameters for these two different inputs, that will correspond to a point on the plot, on this plot. If we reinitialize the network parameters over and over again and plot the outputs of the neural network for these two inputs for each of those reinitializations, then we will get a distribution over network output or equivalently a distribution over functions, which is induced by the distribution over, over parameters. The core result that we're gonna get is that as the hidden layers of the neural network become infinitely wide, this distribution over functions converges to a Gaussian process. Um, and so the distribution over neural network predictions for any set of data points uh, becomes 
jointly go soon as the intermediate layers become infinitely wide with a with a particular um, kernel or covariance matrix that it turns out that that we can compute. So just as a very brief refresher, a uh, Gaussian process is a, um, it's a stochastic process over some continuous domain of random variables, such that any finite collection of those variables is described by a multivariate normal distribution. Um, you are probably most used to seeing Gaussian processes plotted as draws of functions over a 1D domain. So for instance, this plot in the lower right shows several draws from the Gaussian process corresponding to a particular neural network architecture. From this perspective, the plot I showed on the previous slide would correspond to plotting the Y values against each other for two different X values. So these are just two different ways of visualizing the, the same thing. Um, I should pause for a moment and ask, did this, did this pictorial, did this cartoon representation um, make sense? I'm sorry, but what does capital L represent? Ah, so the um, superscript L is the layer in the deep network. So, um, and capital L is the top layer in the, in the network. I'd just like to say, so, Bit confused by the continuity of the curves on the previous plot. So this one here is discrete, but the other one showed continuous variation against either X or Y variables. So I'm not sure if yeah, I can okay, understand okay. discrete discrete or continuous from this. Yeah, so so the so the continuous is like the limit of the discrete as you have an infinite number of, of samples, I think is, is the right way to think about it. Um, and so here we have like some distribution over data, um, so some distribution over the model parameters. And um, we initialize all the parameters in the neural network um, to those values of data. And then we take two inputs to the neural network, X and X star, and we push those inputs through the network. And we look at the, uh, the output of the neural network, the Z, Z capital L here for the um, where L is like the, the total number of layers in the network, and we plot them against each other. And if you draw theta from its prior over and over and over again, then each single draw of theta is a sample from the distribution. But if you look at um, all possible values of theta, then, then you get like the, the continuous distribution, which is what's indicated here by, by the red curves. Um, and maybe, maybe closely connected to that, and this may have been what you're asking. So here we're plotting the ZL for one value of X against ZL for another value of X. Um, I think often when people look at Gaussian processes or Gaussian random fields, they don't um, visualize it as being a um, they don't visualize the field value or the function output value for a small number of discrete outputs. They instead imagine that the Gaussian process gives you a distribution of the functions. And so in that case, what you see in the lower right would be draws from the distribution of the functions given by the Gaussian process. So um, each line in the lower right would correspond to a specific choice of the neural network parameters. So for a specific choice of neural network parameters, you have a fixed input output for the neural network. So every value of X um, gets mapped to a specific value of ZL. And if you initialize the neural network over and over and over again, then every time you reinitialize the neural network, the neural network is computing a different random function. And that corresponds to a different line on this lower right plot. And the observation is just that if um, you are, if your distribution of functions is given by a Gaussian process, then if you take any two potential inputs and you just do a scatter plot 
of the function output at input one versus the function output at input two, then that will be uh, jointly a Gaussian. Okay, thanks. That really helps. And what is the special sure. value of x that gives the minimum width for ZL? Could you repeat that again? What is this? What's special about the value of x that gives the minimum width for ZL? Ah, so there's no. Um, ah, so so Z so Z capital L is the output of the neural network, um, and. Um, the thing that's special about, so there's nothing special about the X that corresponds to the network width. It's rather more the other way around, which is that as the neural network becomes wider, as it has more and more and more units, then um, the distribution of functions computed by the neural network becomes a Gaussian process. So um, a Gaussian process is like the analog of a Gaussian, um, but for for functions instead of a, a, a discrete number of variables, and and so the connection to width is just that as the width of the neural network becomes wider, the the distribution of the functions it computes no, um, I wasn't, collapses. Yeah, I wasn't talking. Together. Sorry, I wasn't talking about the width of the neural network. I was talking about the width of the distribution in Z L. Ah, so that that depends. Um, that's a really good question, um, which maybe segues nicely to to the next the next part of the talk. Um, the width of the distribution in ZL depends on the the kernel or the covariance matrix of the Gaussian process, and and we're about to we're about to derive that. Okay. Um, cool. Okay, so. These these next few slides are going to be um, a little bit a little bit mathematically dense. Um, hopefully, hopefully um, they they uh, provide provide insight and, and interest as well. Um, so now that I've shown you with a cartoon what the result is going to be, let's work through a a sketch for for why it, it's true. Um, the Derivation I'm going to give here is closest to that in, in Roman and Michalis ICLR 2019 paper, which is the, the bolded reference in the lower right. So, so I would recommend looking there if you want, if you want more details. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to note that the pre-activation ZL. So these are the um, inputs to neurons at layer L in the neural network are a weighted sum of Gaussian random variables corresponding to the weights and the biases of the network, um, where the coefficients for each of those Gaussian random variables are the preceding activations YL. So what this means is that the ZL are jointly Gaussian or are a Gaussian process conditioned on the preceding activations YL. Um, and I want to, to emphasize here that the ZL are a Gaussian process because the weights and biases are Gaussian. And we're not because the weights and biases are draws from a Gaussian. We're not assuming activations in the previous layer are Gaussian, and we haven't yet taken anything to the infinitely wide. This is true even for, for um, finite with neural networks. Um, the, the covariance or kernel of this Gaussian process describing ZL. Um, depends on the covariance or, or the gram matrix KL of the preceding activations YL. And here, the weight initialization scale, sigma squared W, um, just changes the overall magnitude of the covariance matrix. Um, if you take your Ys and you multiply them by larger weights, then you're going to get the same covariance matrix just scaled up. Um, while the bias, on the other hand, is added identically to all um, inputs. Um, the bias is shared for all inputs X. And so the bias makes data points more similar and makes the covariance matrix um, more like a constant. Um, in, in practice, if we were to apply this 
analysis to a neural network, we would compute this, this covariance matrix um, or this square matrix KL for all pairs of data points. And so K, K super L would be a number of data points by number of data points, um, second moment matrix. Um, cool. So what this says is that the pre-activations for layer L are a Gaussian process conditioned on the preceding activations. So what this says is, is if you take Ys and you apply a random affine, you apply an affine transformation to them with like random weights and random biases, then after the affine transformation, you have you have a, a Gaussian distribution um, induced by the Gaussian distribution of the weights and biases. But if we just like look at this for a moment, we can notice that ZL only depends on YL through its second moment matrix KL. Because of this, uh, we can say that ZL is a Gaussian process conditioned on the second moment matrix KL rather than conditioned on YL. And just for reference, you can see that I've just added the equation for the, the um, gram matrix or second moment matrix on, on the right. Cool. Okay. So this particular step is, is where we're going to reach like peak mathematical complexity in the whole talk. And then it will be like a relaxing, relaxing, and hopefully engaging um, um, path from, from there on out. Um, so K0, but that also means that the slide is a particularly great spot as I finish it to, to ask questions. So K0 is the data data um, second moment matrix or gram matrix at, at the input layer. Um, KL is the gram matrix of, of YL. Um, YL, as, as you might remember from the definition of the neural network, is the activations after applying the nonlinearity. So YL is equal to phi of Z L minus one. And so what we can do is we can take this definition for the gram matrix and we can substitute in phi of Z L minus one into the equation um, for KL. Um, and however, from, from step two above, we also know that ZL minus one. So we also know that the distribution over pre-activations in the layer below are themselves samples from a Gaussian process given the gram matrix uh, KL minus one from, from the layer below. And so what this means is that KL here is a sum over units, uh, units I, of uh, phi zi and l minus one um, for inputs x and inputs x prime uh, divided by the number of units. So KL is an average over, um, KL is an average over samples from a Gaussian process. And as NL goes to infinity, as the number of, of samples in the average goes to infinity, we can replace this average over samples with an integral over the distribution generating the samples. Um, where again, this distribution generating samples um, is just a Gaussian multivariate Gaussian process, uh, is just a Gaussian process. So this integral is a integral over, over multivariate Gaussian distribution. So in, in the limit, we replace the entries in the second moment matrix for each pair of inputs x and x prime with an integral over a 2D Gaussian of the product of phi of z and phi of z prime. This integral is deterministic. So KL given KL minus one is deterministic. And so for shorthand, we will define a functional f 
which corresponds to computing this 2D integral for all pairs of inputs, and which transforms k of l minus 1 into kl. Um, I would like to emphasize that computing this transformation only involves computing a 2D integral. Um, there are a bunch of situations where you can solve this integral analytically. So for instance, if, if the, if the nonlinearity in your network is an error function or a rectified linear unit, you can um, solve it analytically. But even when you can't solve it analytically, um, you can efficiently numerically uh, compute a, a 2D integral. Um, okay, so this was the mathematical high watermark. This is an excellent time to pause to pause for questions. Uh, if you have questions, someone else will too. So, so please, please ask questions. Uh, just in the sense, uh, very generally, of why inputs to a neural network aren't represented by a single one-dimensional x. Why is it x prime? What's that representing? Ah, OK. So x and x prime are two different inputs to the neural network. So, so what we're what we're looking at here um, cross correlation is, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you're what we're yeah. So what we're what we're really interested in is we want to know how the neural network um, at, for output for input x prime um, will relate to the neural network output for input x, and um, it turns out that the relationship between the neural network output for input x prime and the neural network output for input x um, is just a, um, they're just going to be jointly Gaussian with each other. And so we can fully characterize the relationship if we can figure out the covariance of that, of that Gaussian. OK, you're just trying to create an error signal so you can drive the network into. Yeah, so actually, so this is not for, for training. So, so far, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand um, the behavior of the neural network at initialization. So we just want to know. So even before you train the neural network, you just like draw the parameters from some, like you just randomly initialize the neural network. And at random initialization, the neural networks compute some function. And, and later in the talk, we are going to, to discuss at a high level like what happens during training. But, but right now, we're just asking this, this function that you get by randomly initializing your neural network, what does it look like? But what are the properties of that function? Uh, could you go back a few slides to where it got two different plots of showing our new networks actually? Uh, yeah, it's here. Uh, the next one, maybe. Yeah. The next one. Oh, uh, yeah. So so if we know beforehand that uh, our neural networks serves like as a GP, then we expect yeah. the, 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 the lower right plot, right? So my question is, does the plot in lower right serves as a justification of our new networks actually works like a GP? So say if we have a, a small new network, which is not maybe not very wide, but if we I, if I play the same plot as you as you did in lower right and, and I saw a similar plot, does it mean that my new network actually works like a GP? Um so uh I, sh I should be careful to I should be careful answering this um, because so so if if you so the the answer is it is it is suggestive but but it's not enough evidence on its own to to guarantee it um, and and the reason for that is you could um, for instance have a lot of samples that look to your eye like they're joint Gaussian but they could have like Hidden structure, which, which um, is not is not apparent to you. Um, this is this is always a problem with with modeling with modeling data. Like you you can never you can never be sure that there's not some other explanation of the data that like perfectly explains, for instance, what looks like random noise to you, or or that explains like fine structure that 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 you just don't even recognize. Um, and so it would be very hard to just look at the output of the network and conclude definitively that that um, it is very well described that that like it's fully described by by a simple distribution. But but if you were to plot your outputs of your network and you were to get something that looked a lot like a Gaussian, then then that would be like 
to, that would be pretty strong evidence that it's that's yes, you might. Okay, thank you. So I have one question regarding this definition. Yeah. Um, um, according to this definition, um, doing the forward pass through the network at a point X um, depends on all of the data points that you have in the data set, where you, you can, like um, the, the mean and the covariance matrix. Um, um, no, I mean- uh, so, so, so each, um, each point goes to the network totally independently of each other. Um, but the outputs end up end up correlated because they all use the same weights and biases. So it's not it's not that the data points know about each other. It's that if you if you take um, two data points and you add the same bias vector to them, then they're going to look a little bit. Um, their covariance is going to be a little bit larger after you add the same bias vector than it was than it was before you added it. I see. Okay, thank you. So, so the similarity between data points is is induced by the fact that the data points are going through the same neural network with the same the same parameters. Um, they don't they don't talk to each other. Um, cool. So. I'm gonna do the last the last bit of, of this kind of derivation sketch is just putting these pieces together. So um, from, from point one, we know that the top layer logits, that the outputs of the neural network are, are Gaussian given the second moment matrix KL of, of the preceding activations. Um, in turn, we know that each of the matrices, each of the second moment matrices KL are deterministic functions of the second moment matrix from the layer below. And so if you just apply this recursively, what this means is that the top layer logits are a GP conditioned on the second moment matrix of the inputs and thus conditioned on, on the inputs. Um, and this GP, this Gaussian process has a particular um, compositional kernel or, or covariance matrix, which can be found by by applying f to the input kernel l times in a row, which we which we write as f l, and then um, adding the terms sigma squared w and sigma squared b to account for the the variance of the of the readout weights and biases. So, what this says is that the distribution of the functions computed by a neural network at initialization is described by a Gaussian process um, with a particular compositional kernel that we that we know how to compute. Cool. I think I'm going to 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 move on. So the initialization of a neural network, of course, corresponds to, to the very beginning of, of training. And so one of the very first things we can do with our understanding over the distribution over functions induced by um, a neural network is, is to predict um, trainability to predict whether the neural network will, will be trainable or not. So in order to evaluate trainability at initialization, we can look at what happens to this second moment matrix um, or gram matrix as the network becomes B. So as a reminder, KL, you could think of as being the covariance between um, um, as being the, the, the inner product or a second moment matrix between different inputs to the neural network um, at, at layer L in the network. So you can imagine you put an input into the bottom of the network and then you pass it through an affine layer and a point-wise nonlinearity 
and an app on layer by myself and Arity, and each of uh, um, and after you do that L times, then then you have the, the pre-activation ZL at layer L network. And and they have a a second moment matrix, or they have a covariance matrix that comes from, from KL. So one, one common behavior of recurrent processes is that they converge to, to a fixed point. And, and generically that they tend to decay towards this, this um, fixed point exponentially quickly. Um, that is in fact what happens here. So what we can do is we can write K capital L, we can write the, the gram matrix um, at layer big L network in terms of a fixed point K star plus a term which decays um, exponentially with depth over some depth scale, which I'm going to write chi C um, towards that fixed point. And in order to understand trainability, we can examine how this decay towards a fixed point changes as a function of the initialization hyperparameters. Um, sigma squared W, which is the scale of the weight initialization, and sigma squared B, which is the scale of the bias initialization. So here we illustrate this for a um, deep fully connected networks with 10 H nonlinearities. And we see that we end up with these um, two regimes um, with qualitatively different behavior. Um, so we end up basically with a phase diagram describing the behavior of the neural network at initialization. So when sigma squared B is large, then the shared bias vector causes initially dissimilar inputs to converge and the fixed point corresponds to the activation vectors at deeper and deeper layers of the network becoming identical for, for all inputs. Um, which means that the entries in, in the gram matrix um, K star also, also become, become constant. On the right side of the plot, on the other hand, the tendency of large weights to push apart um, initially similar inputs dominates. And no matter how similar inputs to the neural network start out, they are made increasingly dissimilar with increasing depth. Um, as captured by the, the scale of entity contribution to the, to, the, um, to the gram matrix. And so these two behaviors induce ordered and chaotic regimes where depending on how you initialize the neural network, you either expect all inputs to the neural network to collapse and become identical with depth in the order regime, or you expect initially similar inputs to become pushed apart and the network to essentially act as a, as a hash function. In, in the chaotic regime. Uh, does, it, does it make sense what this, what this diagram is, is illustrating? So, so what's your intuitive explanation of this? Yeah, so the intuitive explanation is, is that um, if the bias, um, is um, very large, then whatever the input to a layer is, um, after you add the bias, like the signal is going to be mostly from the bias vector. And so um, because you can take two inputs and no matter how different they are, you're adding the same bias vector to them, they're going to look like more similar to each other at each layer in the neural network as you add the shared bias vector to them over and over and over again. And so they will they will um, collapse towards becoming identical vectors as a neural network SD. So, um, I mean, presumably having very very large bias doesn't really necessarily give you a good uh, network. So the fact that yeah. they converge might be converging to something you don't want. Yeah, for sure. So so you can kind of imagine that with this. Um, plot is showing you is two different pathologies you can have, um, and and as we'll as we'll get to in a minute, 
there's like a dashed line that in the middle, like at the at the phase transition, which like exactly balances between these two two pathologies, and that turns out to be where you want your neural networks to live. So in the ordered regime, um, the neural network is useless because um, all information about the inputs is lost; they just become identical. And in the chaotic regime, the neural network is useless because no matter um, what structure there was in in your um, input data distribution. Um, it's like it's being pushed through a hash function. You get like no, no, you just get random, essentially random outputs for each of your inputs. And, and both of those um, are very hard to train and also won't, won't work well even to succeed in training them. Um, so, So far, uh, we've talked about propagation of signals, and we've talked about how the distribution over network logics is a Gaussian process. However, um, gradients are linear operators, and a linear op transformation of a Gaussian is, is still a Gaussian. So, so subject to some, some weak constraints, um, the same is true of a Gaussian process. If a function is described by a Gaussian process, then its derivative is also described by a Gaussian process. This means that we can do a nearly identical analysis of the input output Jacobi of the network as, as we did for the forward propagated activations. Um, and here, the input output Jacobi of the network is just the derivative of the neural network outputs. Um, with respect to the neural network inputs X. So it's like D Z capital L DX. When we do this, we find that in the ordered phase, the Jacobian norm goes to zero and gradients, gradients vanish. Um, and this is maybe what you should expect because in the ordered freight um, phase, all the inputs in the neural network become identical. So you change the input and the output doesn't change, um, which, which corresponds, in fact, to, to the gradient going to zero. Um, whereas in the chaotic phase, because small changes to inputs cause very large changes in outputs, the Jacobian norm goes to infinity and, and gradients explode. Um, we typically train neural networks by gradient descent on their parameters. And so you might imagine that if the um, gradients go to zero or the gradients go to infinity. Both of these behaviors make training neural networks uh, quite, quite difficult. Um, there is, however, a line down the center where something different must happen. So along this critical line, it turns out that the two tendencies perfectly balance. K does not exponentially decay towards its point, and the gradient does not exponentially explode or vanish. So it seems plausible that in order to train an extremely deep neural network, this line is likely a really good place to, to do it. Um, this this should be very reminiscent to you of um, phase diagrams from, from physics, where you have some like order parameters like describing the behavior of the system. And here, those order parameters are the scale at which you initialize the weights or the biases. And the system behaves in, in very different ways, depending on, on where you are huh. in, in that phase diagram. Um, and, and a lot of the most interesting behavior um, happens uh, right at the boundary between between phases. It happens when you're not you're not falling into either of the the like either the, the order of the frozen regime or the or the chaotic or or you can maybe think of it as like high temperature kind of kind of regime. Um, so 
it seems like something magical might happen along this critical line um, that divides these two these two pathological these two pathological regimes. And in fact, um, we find that to be true. So here here's an experiment we did where we train uh, vanilla convolutional neural networks. Um, so these are our um, CNNs, but without residual connections or, or batch norm or any of the other usual techniques or, or tricks, um, people use very deep um, neural networks. Um, and we do this, basically the only thing we do is we do this with an initialization that's carefully chosen to rely exactly on this critical line. Um, we also choose this initialization to satisfy another property called dynamical isometry, which uh, demands that the, the um, eigenvalues, the Jacobian spectrum, also be well conditioned, but, but which, which I'm not going to talk about here. And um, by making this, this simple change to, to initialization, we are suddenly able to train um, CNNs up to depths of, of at least 10,000 layers, um, which is as far as we, we can push a compute um, with near identical train and test curves as, as for shallow networks. Um, this, is, this is orders of magnitude deeper than have been achieved with, with vanilla architectures um, before, before this point. Um, so, so cool. So we've we've just taken a little bit of a of a, of a path. We've we've um, done some like first principles analysis, and we've um, understood the distribution over functions um, that neural networks will have at initialization, depending on their initial and hyperparameters. Then we've made a prediction about how that distribution over functions will make neural networks either easier or harder to train. And then we've used that prediction to initialize a neural network in a way that we think will be very easy to train. And then we've shown that by doing this, we can train neural networks that are several orders of magnitude deeper than, than was previously possible. Um, so, so cool. We've gone, we've gone from, from experimental observation that, that large width helps to, to a, a theory for behavior at large width to, to um, a practical recipe for, for training, training deeper networks. So given that the accuracy is the same for 1,000 depth as 10,000, what's the advantage of yeah. 10,000? Yeah, that's a that's an awesome question. Um, so um, the um, one part of the answer is is that at some point there's not going to be much more advantage. Um, so so probably by the time you've gone to depth one thousand, going from depth one thousand to ten thousand doesn't give you a huge advantage. Um, not not shown here, but increasing depth at 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 smaller numbers like up to like order 100 has has shown um, significant advantage, advantages in accuracy. Um, if if you were had infinite compute and infinite data, then the expressivity, the um, amount of information, the, the space of function that the neural network is capable of learning um, does get greater as it gets deeper. So so in some like infinite training data, infinite training compute limit. Um, being able to train deeper would would continue continue to be better. So you start the network off on the critical line, but as the training progresses, yeah. are there trends that tend to push it off the critical line, or is it going to stay on there? Yeah, actually, so that 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 segues um, into something else that I would like to talk about um, in in a couple minutes. Um, but the answer is that. Um, when the neural network is relatively narrow or when it has a relatively small number of channels, then, then over the course of training, it will tend to wander off the critical line. But as the neural network gets wider and wider and larger and larger, it will stay closer and closer and closer to the critical line um, throughout training. Um, and 
that was for some specific network, that critical line. I and mean, you have to recompute it every every time you do this? Uh, yeah, so, so in fact, um, and I'm, I'm not gonna talk about these in detail, but in fact, you can do a similar, like kind of like new deal to phase diagram style analysis um, for a whole variety of, of different, different architectures. Um, but it is also like, um, we're kind of like still building out the universality classes if you like. Like we're still, we're still building out like what these sets of like qualitative behavior um, you can observe as a function of hyperparameters is in neural networks. Um, and we're, we're starting to get some, some work that kind of like unifies unifies the analysis for, for different uh, for different networks. Uh, you, should, you should look especially maybe at some recent papers by, by Greg Yang. But, but yeah, you can, do, you can do a closely analogous um, type of analysis where you build a phase diagram for the neural network and then you predict this behavior based upon that phase diagram for, for um, many, many architectures or, or network designs. Um, and here at least if you do it for a lot of different uh, network designs. Um, um, Cool. So what have we done? We've said that overparameterization practically seems to make neural networks do better. Um, we've uh, derived the func distribution over functions, which you can expect um, if you, uh, which is induced by random initialization of, of neural networks. Um, and we've shown that that distribution of function corresponds to a Gaussian process. We've shown that by looking at the distribution of our functions, you get from random initialization, you can predict whether or not a neural network will be trainable. Um, and you can find the hyperparameters in the architectures that will be most trainable. Um, and I promised earlier that we were going to talk about networks after training. So let's let's briefly talk about how this relates to train networks. Uh, there are maybe two approaches one might imagine using to to uh, train a neural network. The the first of these is Bayesian parameter estimation, where we sample the parameters of the network from their posterior, given the prior over parameters and the observed um, training samples. And this is. If you're Bayesian, at least this is this is perhaps like the ideal way to, to, to train a neural network, but is also often often impractical. Um, the second and more common way that we train neural networks is we do just steepest we do gradient descent on on the network parameters. Um, I will not go into mathematical depth here, but it turns out that closely related analyses to what we discussed in the first part of the talk can be applied to to both of these approaches. So let's just look at this for the cartoon that we used um, in the first part of the talk. So let's imagine now that X is the training point and X star is a test point. And we know that the network output is one for X. So that's like our training data point. What this is, this is um, equivalent to slicing the joint distribution along this z equals one line. However, because we have two equivalent ways of writing the joint distribution, we also have two equivalent ways of writing like any conditional or marginal or posterior distribution, which is derived from, from the joint. So for instance, one way in which we could make fully Bayesian predictions from a neural network is to draw parameters um, theta from the posterior distribution of the parameters given the training data. So here that's just P of theta given ZL of X equals one. Um, <clears throat> and then after drawing the parameters from their posterior distribution, we could then evaluate Z capital L the output of the neural network um, at the test point for each of those parameter values. 
So here, the x-axis is the logit value for the test point, um, or the output of the neural network for the test point. And the y-axis is the probability of observing that logit value. The distribution over test set predictions that you would get from this method of drawing the parameters from the posterior corresponds to the black delta functions here. The other way, though, in which we could evaluate the Bayesian posterior is just to um, compute in closed form the posterior distribution under the corresponding Gaussian process. This, this here is indicated in a red. Um, and in the infinite width limit, because the distribution induced by drawing the parameters from their prior um, goes to a Gaussian process, um, similarly, this conditional distribution of neural network outputs given the training data um, converges. And you will get exactly the same distribution over test predictions um, by evaluating the GP as you would by drawing the parameters from their posterior. So just to say this a slightly different way, we're interested in the Bayesian posterior over, over test points. And we could either compute this by sampling parameters from the posterior and evaluating the corresponding test prediction for those parameters or we can compute it by directly evaluating the distribution over test set predictions as defined by the GP um, in closed form. Um, and so what this means is that if we want to evaluate the predictions of a wide Bayesian neural network, we never even have to instantiate the network. We could just evaluate the corresponding um, neural network equivalent Gaussian process, like the corresponding NNGP. Um, I think I'm I'm already um, over time. Um, I may have two minutes, depending on, on how you count the start time. Um, now you can so go ahead. And going... straight. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So so um, so I will I will however go to the end without taking more questions. Um, so the distribution over functions computed by by Bayesian parameter estimation app, um, given your training data, um, is described by a Gaussian process, and you can just compute it in closed form. You never even have to instantiate a neural network. Perhaps even more surprising than that is that closely related techniques like also apply to neural networks trained by gradient descent. And it's going to turn out that you can also get the distribution of the functions induced by gradient descent training of a neural network. Um, of a wide neural network without ever instantiating the, the neural network. Um, I'm only going to give a little bit of intuition for what's happening in, in, this, in this result. Um, so the core effect is, um, I have a toddler here too. Um, so the core effect is, is that in the large width limit, um, the number of units in intermediate layers goes to infinity. And um, each of those units changes only by an infinitesimal amount over the entire course of, of training. And um, those infinite number of units in the middle of the network, all of which change only infinitesimally, conspire together to, to produce an order one change in the neural network output. Um, and similarly with the parameters, the, um, and the infinite number of parameters in the middle of the network as the width goes to infinity, all change infinitesimally and, and conspire to produce like exactly the order one change that you want to see in the output of the neural network. Um, however, because each of the units and receptive fields in the middle of the network change only infinitesimally, they can all be replaced by the first order Taylor approximation. So in the limit of infinite width, it turns out that throughout training, a neural network can be replaced by its linearization. Um, that is to say, the output of the neural network will correspond to its output on initialization um, plus its parameter gradient at initialization times the, the change of parameters, um, and then plus a term that goes to zero with increasing width. Um, I, I just to, to make this really clear, I would like to emphasize this does not mean that deep nonlinear neural networks become linear networks um, as they get wide. 
their output is still a super complicated nonlinear function of their inputs. It's just that throughout changing, throughout training, the change in their outputs is linear in the change in their and their parameters. Um, and I, I presented this in in parameter space, um, but you should see the the NTK paper for for the analogous ideas in in function space. Um, so we can explore this experimentally, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, we um, can also do one other cool thing, which I'll mention really briefly, which is we don't just know, um, we know the full distribution over functions that you get by randomly initializing a neural network. And then we know that um, if the network is wide enough over the course of gradient descent training, the neural network evolves um looks like a linear a linear model um and we know what happens how a gaussian distribution evolves um on under a linear model and so it turns out that we can derive not just the distribution over functions at initialization but the distribution over the output of of trained neural networks Um, and we can perform some experiments with this. Um, I don't have time to go into this, but let me just briefly say that if you reduce the neural network to um, its um, simplest case, so you train the neural network with a very small learning rate and you don't use weight decay, uh, you use L2 regularization, and um, you um, yeah, so if you if you force the neural network to be trained um, without a lot of the tricks that improve test accuracy, then what you find is that um, for many but not all architectures, this like infinite width limit, um, the the um, um, either infinite like gradient descent train networks or infinite Bayesian Bayesian networks um, outperform the the finite width networks. Um, CNN with global average pooling is maybe an exception to that. But you also find that um, if you start throwing in all the tricks that people use in practice when, when they train finite width neural networks, then, then the finite width neural networks um, perform better and better and better and, and outperform the, the kernel methods. Um, I think it will be super interesting over the next couple of years to see how far kernel methods can also be pushed as we develop analogous techniques that improve their performance. Okay, and so last slide. Um, in summary, I have presented what I believe to be a powerful framework for uh, theoretically analyzing neural networks. Um, it can be applied to either a Bayesian or gradient descent training of a neural network in either uh, function space or, or parameter space. And I've shown that this perspective um, enables us to predict how trainability depends on architecture and hyperparameters. Um, I've also shown that it allows us to do like seemingly like semi-magical things like compute test set predictions that would come from training an infinitely wide neural network, but without ever even instantiating a neural network. Um, it's also provided several insights into to network behavior, which I, I mostly haven't had a chance to discuss here, but things like showing that noise regularization limits trainable depth um, or that batch norm induces chaos, or, or um, some has taught us a little bit more about the role of equivariance uh, and weight sharing in, in convolutional neural networks. Um, cool. Um, so that's the structure. I also would like to call out um, there's a GitHub link in the middle. Uh, we have released a um, code library that um, allows you to build infinite width neural networks using identical code to what you use to build finite width neural networks. And so if you want to perform your own experiments with infinite width neural networks, um, then you should follow that GitHub link and it will be be like almost identical to the way in which you would have to would perform experiments with finite width networks. Um, you can you can build whatever architecture you like at infinite width. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. I apologize for trying to cram 
so much information into your brains in 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 this this relatively short short amount of time. I think I was I think I was over ambitious, but hopefully hopefully you also got a sense of how much possibility there is in this in this space. Well, that, that was great. So thanks very much to you for getting up very early and for educating us. I had a lot of fun. So we have a couple more uh, minutes for questions in case people wanted to ask something. There were many questions already during the talk, which is great. Um, I can see there are two in the chat. So I'm just going to read out the first, um, which reads, do you think residual neural networks operate along the critical line naturally, given that they operate okay with increasing depth? Yeah, so um, um, the answer is sort of, the answer is the phase diagram actually looks different for, for residual networks, um, but, but um, they, um, so you can actually adjust the scaling of residual networks so they operate a little bit better. Um, in that, in that, as as they as they are kind of typically implemented, the the contribution from from later um, side chains um, becomes relatively smaller, which is is not necessarily desirable. Um, but but also they they a lot of I think a lot of modern architectural um, tweaks um, kind of. Um, do something that you could also do with with careful tuning of, of initialization hyperparameters. So I think things like like layer norm um, and to to some degree like like batch norm and and um, and ResNets. I think I think all these things, all these things um, are. It's it's never an exact one to one mapping, but they like qualitatively like move you into the good region of the phase diagram. Nice. And there is uh, one more question by Greg, who's asking how one should think about your cartoon of the Z capital L of X versus the same thing of X star or of random function samples, both on sort of the very early slide that you've shown. In the case of a complex train network, such as one that uh, uses that you use to perform image segmentation. Yeah. Um, so um, you can do I mean, I guess the the basic answer is that you still want to compare different inputs to the neural network to each other. Um, the big difference is is that your ZL is no longer a scalar. Your ZL is now like, um, for instance, maybe a class label for every pixel in the image, and and so it's much harder to um, plot it in two D. Um, it turns out actually that for neural networks that produce um, multiple outputs those outputs are jointly Gaussian with each other, as well as Gaussian across input examples. So you end up with um, a, um, a joint Gaussian over with a covariance matrix that's like um, number of outputs times um, number of input examples by number of output features times number of input examples but it's still described by AGP. Can I comment on your answer? Of course. Uh, go, please, yeah. Yes, thanks. I guess I was, I'm just trying to sort of understand how to reconcile the sort of simplicity of the GP aspect that you're describing with the obvious complexity that a network like that performs. So what is it really, um, in the cartoon, you can't really see the complexity and the simplicity at the same time. So I'm, uh, I'm sort of trying to understand what it is about the output that is simple when the output itself is obviously a very complicated function of the input. Do you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if I. Uh, okay, okay. So I, 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 I can throw some thoughts out there, and and I don't. I but we'll see if we'll see if you find them satisfying. Um, or, or not. Um, I think maybe one, one observation is that um, we think of Gaussians as being very simple, but that a um, Gaussian distribution with a complicated covariance matrix in an extremely high dimensional space um, can, can perhaps capture um, surprisingly 
um, strong um, structure. Um, it's maybe answer part one. Answer part two is that um, we like to imagine that neural networks are doing these incredibly complex things. Um, it may be that that they're not. It may be that they're doing something that's a lot closer to to like um, well smooth interpolation between data points, um, which is is more consistent with the GP kind of perspective. Um, answer number three is that the infinite with limit, um, at least the one that we took here, um, doesn't allow feature learning. And it's still very much, I think, an open question, the degree to which nonlinear um, feature learning matters for different architectures. Like if you'd asked me a few years ago, I would have said nonlinear feature learning is like the core of deep learning. Um, and now I think it kind of depends. I think there's some situations where it matters a lot um, and, and some situations where, where I think um, it seems not to really make much of a difference. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if, if any of that is, is satisfying. I think. I think yeah, thank you. That was, that, was, that was very helpful. Thanks. Uh, there's uh, one more question in the chat by by Lord, who is asking, everywhere you assumed that your uh, that your initial parameters are Gaussian, and then you, this is where you get all the Gaussian from in the end. Did you look at any other distributions for the initialization of your parameters at all? And how would they look instead of this infinite with limit? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so most, um, so as long as um, most of the results hold, as long as you have a central limit theorem style result that you can apply um, to to multiplying the parameters times times the inputs, um, times their inputs each layer. Um, it, it, it's a lot less clean. Um, you don't, you don't get like exact Gaussians. You have to like, have to, have to say you, you approximate a Gaussian as you get wider and stuff, but, but the, the qualitatively it continues to hold for, for different initialization distributions. Is there time for one more question? Can I ask, um, I'm a bit worried about infinitely wide layers and thinking about them. Um, if, if I was just doing a conventional polynomial fit to 100 data points and I had 95 free parameters, uh, these, it would oscillate wildly and, and not be very generalizable. Now, is there a danger that uh, with your very, very wide networks, you will learn the uh, specifics of the training set and not have good generalization? Or are you assuming you get, as you widen the network, you have more and more training data? Awesome. Um, so what's really nice about um, having way more parameters than data points, which is the regime that we're in here, is that um, you're kind of free to interpolate between data points however you like. Like you have two data points and you need to fit these two data points exactly. And um, you have so many free parameters that you could make the function do anything you wanted between the two data points. Um, and so what the function actually does between the two data points is basically inherited from the prior. It's basically inherited from, from the random initialization. So if you randomly initialize your function in the chaotic regime so that it looks like this, then you're going to fit these two data points and between the two data points it's going to do this which is like really bad but if you randomly initialize the function in kind of like a smooth regime then you're going to like adjust it to fit the two data points but like its behavior away from the data points is going to like the way in which it interpolates between data points is going to be like smooth like its initialization was and and you you won't you won't do crazy things there's uh, one more question, which asked about your library, actually, I think, uh, and, and specifically about its memory requirements when you do this NNGP thing. Do you have to store any big matrices when you do that, or is it reasonably efficient? Um, it depends on the architecture. Um, you you need to, like, kind of, by definition, though, you need to store a matrix, which is number of data points by number of data points. Um, 
And so for this reason, like um, you're going, you can probably work with CIFAR 10. Um, you could probably work with like 50,000 data points. Um, you're probably not going to be able to work with 500,000 data points. Um, and um, because, um, and there's, there's a trade-off, which is, which is again, um, the training cost of, of typical neural networks is like linear in the data set size. Um, here, um, working with the Gaussian process, um, inference is, is cubic in, in the number of data points that you're working with. So, so um, if you want to do practical things with this, you either need to use like egregious approximations um, or um, you need to be working with a quite small data, point, data set where for small data sets, this may actually work like better than, than training the neural network. Um, but, but, uh, but there are, there are, there are compute costs. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, so I think also had a question in the end. Did, did you still have it? Oh, yes, sorry. I just wanted to clarify what I think you said is that the more layers you have, the more stable the critical line is or not necessarily? Uh, the more layers you have, the um, more you're described by this like kind of like asymptotic with depth behavior. So, so there's um, um, okay, little spinning. Okay, so I overshot. Um, but um, yeah, so so what kind of happens is um, understanding how the neural network behaves for So, so we know that if you go infinitely deep, then the neural network is going to have this like fixed covariance matrix. Um, and we know that if you go very deep, but not infinitely deep, then the covariance matrix is going to like decay like exponentially towards this fixed covariance matrix. Um, if you're quite shallow, then, then you may not be in like the regime around this like fixed point that you can linearize. You may you may not be in this like nicely behaved like exponential decay towards towards the variance matrix. So the division of the neural network into order and chaotic regimes is like becomes much cleaner um, the deeper you go. Um, but but um, even for shallow networks, the critical line seems to be a pretty good place to to be. Thank you. Nice, thanks indeed. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So let me thank you once again on my behalf and on behalf of the entire audience for this great talk. I think all of us really learned a lot. So thanks a lot, Yasha. Thanks for getting up early. Thanks for, for contributing to this seminar series. Thank, thank you, it was, a, it, was a, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks, Yasha, and thanks, Philippe. Bye. That's it for this week. See you next week then. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah,